Hello everyone and a warm welcome back to our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. My name is Elizabeth Duxbury and I'm a postdoc in the research group of Alexei Maklikov at the University of East Anglia and I'll be your host for today's session. Myself and our wonderful team of co-organisers, Andreas, Ulia and Wouter, are very grateful for the enthusiasm from the research community for this initiative and it has been a pleasure to host such a variety of great minds so far. So thank you all for your fantastic engagement in the series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind you that there will be a Q&A session directly after the talk. So please post your questions in the de dedicated Slack channel and upvote the questions you'd like to hear. We aim to keep this whole session to one hour in length. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Robin Dunbar, Professor of Evolutionary Psychology in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. Professor Dunbar's research explores the evolution of sociality in primates, humans, and other mammals. During a remarkable career over 40 years, Robin's research has revealed the constraints on social group size, famously known as Dunbar's number, that is the theoretical limit of 150 people that humans can maintain social relationships with and also the strategies different species can use to challenge these social group size constraints. By using an innovative combination of experimental techniques combined with neuroimaging, mathematical modeling and comparative approaches, Robin has made significant and hugely influential contributions to understanding the mechanisms underlying social bonding rooted in brain evolution, anatomy, cognition, behavior, and even neuroendocrinology. More recently, Robin has also been directly involved in projects exploring how modern technologies and social networking are shaping human relationships and how knowledge of behavior can be used to design online social networks, build simulations, and even apply to robotics. Robin was awarded the 2015 Huxley Memorial Medal for his important services to anthropology and is also the recipient of a prestigious ERC Advanced Investigator Award. Today, Robin will present his talk entitled Trade-offs between fertility and predation in the evolution of mammalian social systems. So Robin, thank you for accepting our invitation and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, just call my slides up first, if we can. Um, so I'm gonna talk really about uh, some more recent work that we've been doing trying to understand the evolution of essentially sociality with particular reference to primates, but um, I always have half a foot in the ungulates in particular, which I've done quite a lot of field work on, probably as much field work on ungulates actually as I have done on primates. And I suppose you know, in the last couple of decades, I've probably done much more stuff myself on humans than I have on animals, but that's partly been with the uh, objective really of trying to understand primate social evolution as much as anything. But there's simply because there's stuff you can, questions you can ask with humans, which are extremely difficult to ask with other species. So most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about really is quite new. Um, there will be uh, bits and pieces that, that come into it that, that may be more familiar to you, but, but most of it probably is going to be new and I hope not too shocking for you. Anyway, here's the starting point. Uh, this is really just a plot of, of uh, mean and range of group sizes in a variety of, of mammals. You've got carnivores there on the left, prosimians. Uh, the anthropoids split in, anthropoid primates split into two, three groupings. Those with more, I would call the less smart uh, monkeys really as much as anything. Uh, who tend to live in rather small groups, um, averaging about 10, 10 to 15, something like that. And then you've got two groups of, of anthropoid primates, mainly old world monkeys and apes, but, but a few new world species as well, who live in very large bonded groups. And among those bonded groups, there are some that then have fish and fusion uh, sociality mapped on top of that. And then on the right-hand side, the ungulates. And the ungulates split here into those who live in modestly stable groups. So the anthropoid groups are all very, very stable, um, even the fish and fusion social system. The ungulates split into those which have stable groups, uh, monogamy, 
um, small harems, um, and again, you can see they're, they're quite small. And then there's the sort of generic herding ungulates. But the size of groups, on average, the average size of groups, opposed to the sort of maximum, uh, what a, whatever it is that uh, wildebeest and saiga antelope go around in millions uh, of herd size of millions. These, this is the average size, tends to be around 30 or so, and very similar in size to the groupings you see in primates. But it's that contrast between these very fission fusiony, unstable, casual uh, herding uh, type social systems and the kinds of very tight bonded groups that primates have, which are quite similar in size, that I'm sort of worrying about trying to explain, if you like, and then why primates manage to achieve these very large group sizes compared to other, um, uh, most other mammals. Uh, and just to emphasize the point here, this is the sort of background to it. Um, uh, this is a, 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 a plot of um, relative brain size against um, a social system across a whole range of mammals plus the birds. Um, and, and the key lesson here, which is this that really sparked our interest in this problem, is if you look at right across the carnivores and the artiodactyls, indeed uh, the perissodactyls as well, the bats and even the birds, it's always monogamously pair bonded species that uh, come out with the large brains. And the species that live in large uh, multi male, multi female groups or live solitarily that actually have relatively small brains. And this is really a very striking contrast with anthropoid primates in particular, where you have this very tight relationship between social group size and brain size, which is kind of reflected here in this sort of, uh, when you plot it the same as the, the other mammals there, it's reflected in, in what looks much more like a, a continuum. So there's something odd going on in primates and, and, and uh, that oddness really comes down to these bonded social groups, but bonded social groups are not unique to the anthropoid primates, but all the anthropoid primates have them, uh, and it's only a very small number of um, bird and other mammal groups that do. So groups, the groups you live in, as we all know, they're uh, a trade-off really between the costs and benefits of um, grouping. Uh, we tend to see the costs in terms of foraging competition in some form, either direct or indirect, and um, that's the sort of standard ecological or ecologist way of thinking about life, I suppose. Um, but we've actually come to the conclusion that actually mostly that's quite a minor problem for most species. That actually, it's certainly for primates, all the um, socio-ecology models we've built for uh, primates, and we've built them for about 12 genera now, all suggest that um, there is no ecological constraint on group size for pretty much everybody. Yes, around the edges of the species geographical range, where they're under very tight e ecological pressure, but in the sort of core central areas that they inhabit, um, uh, biogeographically, um, they could live in much bigger groups um, uh, without running into serious uh, competition with each other. Rather, the problem is this, it's fertility. Um, so here's the sort of what I conceive of the as the sort of base state, as it were, for, for basal uh, mammals. Um, and uh, so we've got a, what have we got? Five different groups here, ranging from goats. These are, these are our goat populations on the Isle of Rum that we've been working on for, on and off for many years. Uh, David McDonald's badgers, their rodents, Barbarissa, the pig, from the from the um, southwest southeast Asia and the American marmots. If you plot either fertility in some way, number of offspring, or better still, litter size per year um, against uh, number of females, what you get is these very consistent, very striking negative relationships, and it seems to be extremely persistent and very strong. And in fact, if you look at the literature, there's a huge literature now uh, suggesting that there are uh, negative effects from the number of females that are co-resident on the fertility of females. And this goes from rodents up on the top right there, right the way through 
uh, various carnivores, equids, uh, and into the primates, a whole variety of primates, including humans down there at the bottom. The more females you have, something happens uh, uh, to the fertility and it just crashes. Actually, we know what causes this. We've known about the cause of this for a very long time, in fact. Um, uh, it was uh, primarily worked out by Barry Coburn in Cambridge and, and Dave Abbott and, and the group he was bedded in at, at Edinburgh originally back in the 80s. And it simply has to do with the effects both physiological, uh, physical and social uh, stress uh, has on the menstrual system endocrinology. So normally there's a, a cascade in mammals that um, starts in the brain uh, goes down through the various components, ends up with this LH surge, luteinizing hormone surge, which kicks in ovulation uh, at the right point in the menstrual cycle. Um, when you've got stress, that somehow blocks uh, the uh, production of um, uh, gonadotrophins right at the start of the system in the brain. And the, the result is the cascade is cut off, there's no trigger no LH surge and there's no ovulation. You still get a normal, what looks like a normal menstrual cycle, but it's just as completely infertile. Um, again, you know, there's been a tendency for, for, for ecologists thinking in terms of uh, nutrient throughputs to assume that, that um, fertility and everything else to do with reproduction is primarily driven by food availability. But what's interesting about this stuff is, is particularly work that was done on, on uh, a sort of international uh, level um, athletes, women athletes, suggests that weight loss is not the issue here. It's not starvation. You have to lose something in the order of 15% of body weight before the same system uh, kicks in, before you get a loss of fertility. And it, it seems pretty much as though, in fact, actually it's uh, the physical stresses of starvation are kicking in exactly the same thing for the same reason. And that's seems to be because we experience uh, uh, social, psychological stress and psychological pain in the same part of the brain as, as we experience physical pain. And it's become very clear from work on, on domestic species that, that the problem is social rather than ecological. And the, the sort of through the 90s, the um, um, agricultural folk and veterinarians have, have became seriously interested in the problem of loss of fertility in cattle in particular uh, um, and, and how to deal with it. And eventually they came to the conclusion the problem wasn't the amount of food that was provided, it was the stocking levels you had. It's the number of uh, cows that were uh, crammed together, if you like, in the same field or the same paddock that was the problem. You could put as much food in there as you liked and it wouldn't make any difference at all to their, their fertility. So that's what seems to be the problem. That's what seems to be driving this. Um, what's effectively driving, what's effectively happening as a consequence of this is that there's a massive limit on, on um, uh, the size of groups you can possibly have. So here is this kind of suggestion, obviously there's some lower limit here below which you can't grow, uh, drop fertility, otherwise you go into negative population growth. Um, but that looks like it's somewhere around 10 females. You just can't have groups with more than about 10 females together. Um, primates seem to have solved that problem, uh, at least partially, along with some other species. And here's two examples. One is data on banding mongoose uh, um, uh, from, from uh, Ginsburg's uh, data from way back. And the other is some of Craig Packer's data on his lions. So um, the mongoose data are, are, are three different years. Um, buried in there are, are very clearly these this hump these hump shaped curves, and you can see the humps very clearly in in the um, lion data. So this is holding all the this is their equation for lion fertility um, from the Serengeti, uh, holding everything else constant except for the number of females and the pride. And uh, you can see these these very very striking humps. Um, both of these notice of intensely social species that have bonded social systems. Um, you see exactly the same princ principle at work in primates. So these are colobus monkeys, what I'd class as relatively stupid old world monkeys. Uh, they're leaf eaters, which probably doesn't help. Female fertility is just a negative, straight negative uh, 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 consequence of the number of females in the group. 
there's a uh, pretty much sets a, a, a lower limit at around seven females, which gives you a group size of somewhere around 15 to, to 20 um, in primates consistently. Um, uh, females, adult breeding females account for about a third of group size right the way across the entire order, basically. But you look at some of the smart monkeys, uh, these are gelada baboon data, uh, looking at fertility as a function of um, their reproductive units, the size of their reproductive units, the harems. Again, you see this hump shape, and that's allowing them to push the number of females up to somewhere around 12 or, or, or to 15, which is increasing um, uh, uh, the group size that they can live in quite, quite considerably. So the question is, uh, what's actually happening? Now, the, the key difference between these two particular species is that the colobus monkeys on the left are, don't really have very strong relationships with each other uh, within the group. They're not very strongly bonded groups. The gelada baboons do. They're, they're extremely strongly bonded, uh, both uh, among the females and between the females and the male. Now, if you look at primates as a whole, which is what we've done, and, uh, and simply do a multiple regression, uh, standard multiple regression of either birth rates, birth per female per year, or immature rates, that's the number of living immatures, um, pre-puberty immatures per female at, a, at any given moment in time, census time, and regress that against group size, number of males in the group, number of females, this is what you get, right? You get this very positive, uh, uh, relationship with the size of the group, you get zero correlation on the whole uh, with, with the number of males in the group. And this is kind of ironic because I spent about 25 years probably doing field work on both primates and ungulates uh, on trying to show that um, males were a disruptive effect on uh, population dynamics. And, uh, uh, of these species, and it turns out they have no effect at all. But what you have is this very striking negative effect. So this is what's creating this hump. So the uh, the the, the left-hand side of that hump on, on this relationship is the positive effect of group size kicking in, and the right-hand side is the negative effect uh, of the number of females um, uh, overwhelming the positive effect of of the left-hand side of uh, the group size effect. So what's happening is that steep negative decline of uh, uh, female-driven uh, infertility that you see on, in, in the colobus monkeys has been pushed over to the right to allow, uh, uh, enable a, a positive benefit of group size to come in. Um, <clears throat> so Interestingly enough, if you look at the mongoose data I showed you, you get exactly the same effect. Uh, a positive effect due to the size of the group, a negative effect due to the size of the number of females, and no effect at all um, due to males. <clears throat> so this takes us back really to uh, what's going on in primates. And these are uh, the original group size plotted against brain size data from the social brain effect. And this is an object lesson, I think, in many ways, in how careful you sometimes have to be with these kind of analyses. Because what everybody has always done, me included, is just stuck a standard regression line through that and gone, there you go. Uh, here's the relationship. Um, but if you look at the data carefully here, uh, this isn't really a case where norm, a norm, standard regression model should be used. These data are not bivariate normal by any stretch of the imagination. Um, they're a tube, right? So they're, they're, the variance is uniform and it's uniform pretty much all the way up. And that's always a clue in these kind of da comparative data that what you're dealing with here are grades uh, rather than a single data set. So when we've come to analyze uh, these original data, and we, we've now done it, the, the, the data you were just looking at are the same data on the, the graph on the right-hand side, the large graph on the right-hand side, 
headed D. Um, <clears throat> Uh, on the left-hand side, the little graphs are simply exactly the same analysis for four other brain data sets. So they're all completely independent. They're collected by other people um, uh, on different animals. The only ones that are comparable are the third one down, the Stefan data set, and the, the one in front of you. Uh, but they're looking at different, different measures of, of uh, brain size, the left-hand one, C, is looking at the amount of non-visual cortex. So it's taking the neocortex and removing the visual areas at the back because they basically don't do anything except uh, visual processing, so they're not involved in social cognition in any way, or indeed even in ecological problem solving for that matter. <clears throat> so if you take that out, that should improve the fit, is the, is the, has always been the argument. Um, the right-hand side looks looks at neocortex ratio. The neocortex ratio is kind of odd because it always turns out to produce much, much tighter relationships, no matter what you look at. If you look at cognitive abilities or behavioral abilities or group sizes or practically anything else you care to put in there, it always produces much better uh, uh, fits than, than, than um, any other brain measure you care to use. Um, uh, and, um, and we think that's probably because what it's doing is, is picking up on the relative investment in the bits of the brain that count. So just on the left, the, the, the run down what they are, the, the top one is simply cranial volume, intracranial volume, total, basically total brain size, which in, inevitably includes a whole bunch of junk that isn't even involved in doing anything, including the spaces in the brain for that matter. Uh, but it also includes all the, the subcortical areas. Um, the second one, the Neverett, Neverett uh, data set is just measuring total neocortex volume. Then the Stefan data set takes out a part of that that's not really functional in terms of problem solving, decision making. And the bottom one is, is frontal lobe volume and frontal lobes are where much of the active work is being done for um, uh, reasoning and decision making and anything else like that. Okay, so basically, if you look at these data and you run a clustering uh, uh, algorithm on them, something like k-means clustering, um, consistently what they throw up is uh, a division into four separate grades. Um, and you get this in all four data sets. Um, there are only three lines in some of them simply because there's only one data point in, on the fourth grade. So even I've resisted the temptation to put a, a regression line through, through a, 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 an N of one. Um, but ba basically you can see the four grades very nicely. What's interesting about these grades is they have nothing to do with taxonomy. Now actually, I realized these grades existed about 25 years ago. It's taken me 25 years actually to figure out how to analyze these data because most phylogenetic, all phylogenetic, uh, certainly all modern phylogenetic methods uh, um, just create a pig's dinner out of it because the, there is no phylogenetic component in here at all. So the um, effectively what you're looking at, looking at D, is on the right hand, uh, left hand slope, a bunch of uh, very, very um, uh, a, almost a social species in, 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 with very little bonding, that live in rather chaotic fission fusion type, uh, often semi solitary uh, social systems, particularly the prosimians are, are of that kind. The, the, the uh, second, um, data set which second grade which is the the, the dark symbols the filled symbols uh, are um, uh, uh, bond they, they start being more bonded they're, they're more coherent they have fairly stable groups the uh, next line over which is now in um, unfilled symbols to show them up uh, uh, the smart monkeys essentially and, and over on the right uh, you've got the apes up at the top bung up all the way across through all of these, you, you've got a complete mix of um, taxonomy. So you've got new world monkeys and some one old world monkey on the left-hand graph with these prosimians. You've got prosimians in the second and the third um, 
uh, uh, grades, you've got old world monkeys um, at the bottom of the uh, right hand grade there. So it's a complete taxonomic mix. Um, if, if you're not careful and you try to use standard uh, phylogenetic methods, it just wipes that pattern out. This is actually done with, with on the basis of um, uh, using phylogenetic methods, but we had to go back to very old fashioned steam stuff and use uh, contrast methods. And that ultimately was actually the advice that was given to us by Mark Pagel, because he scratched his head about this as well, um, and, and, and thought that was the best way of, of doing it. So uh, everything's calculated against a um, uh, RMA regression line uh, derived from the R, uh, uh, um, contrast between group size and, and contrast and uh, brain size. And then you get these very clear uh, grade lines. Okay. So the difference between the grade lines is very striking in terms of some of the components. So here, here's just the, the, the number of species or the percent of species that live in bonded social groups. So bonded social groups are either monogamous pairs or very tightly based um, uh, substructured uh, social groups where individuals have very specific grooming relationships with other individuals. So you have a social network which is highly substructured rather than being kind of amorphous and everybody's grooming with everybody else. You can see this in steady increase um, uh, in, 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 in the proportion of uh, bonded social systems as you go across the grades there. And this raises a kind of important distinction, I think, which uh, we've kind of lost sight of a little bit, I think, um, partly because of a sort of shift of focus away from what's going on at the group level to what's going on at, uh, uh, among individuals interacting with each other. But um, my, my angst on this is always that we forget that animals live in groups at our peril. Groups set up their... Uh, range of possibilities for the behavioral strategies they can affect. So we really need to understand what constrains the groups and the group sizes and the group compositions they have, because those are the kind of the, the, the context in which they then play out their more conventional um, uh, sociobiological type strategies. So I want to draw a very clear distinction. These are quite old terms uh, that were very current in, in, in the 60s and 70s to differentiate between these kind of bonded social systems and these sort of more chaotic, casual social systems of the kind you find in herding species, aggregations and congregations. So aggregations are essentially herds, congregations are groups that come together and have this kind of stability. Um, <clears throat> The big advantage of uh, uh, aggregations or herding social systems, fish and fusion social systems, is they solve that fertility problem instantly, right? If things are just getting too much, you can, you can gather together when some threat, say for example, a predator or, or some benefit like a, a, a rich uh, uh, feeding site appears. But when the stresses uh, of living in the group um, start to increase, then you can simply disperse and, and go into smaller groups and, and uh, um, remove that, that, that um, uh, major cost altogether. The species that live in stable social groups, congregations uh, uh, in this sense, can't do that. And so somehow they have to solve the problem. And that's um, really what this bonded process is really all about. Um, uh, and, you know, this is coming in at various levels. Uh, the baboons there on the, the, the bottom left are in, intensely social, spend a huge amount of time engaged in social grooming. Some of these primates can spend up to a fifth of their entire day, 20% of uh, daytime, engaged in, in social grooming. This is a huge cost they're paying to be able to live in a group. Uh, but it produces these very, very intense relationships. And, and we now know the mechanism that's involved. It happens to be the, uh, the same mechanism that triggers the, the or in, involve the same neuroendocrines that, that trigger the infertility uh, problem. 
but that's another story. But uh, in the middle, um, uh, uh, a pair of Klipspringer, these are very intensely monogamous. They're, they're never more than that distance apart from each other. Um, they track each other constantly. Uh, there's a classic um, small antelope um, uh, pair bonded social system. I, um, these are all my, my three favorite species simply because these are the ones I've worked on. And on the right hand side, um, goats, uh, feral goats. I think these are, in, these are from uh, my North Wales population, um, uh, who are representative here of, of, of um, standard um, uh, herding uh, ungulates. But the difference here is in the, the, the cost to them in creating these bonds and, and maintaining these social bonds. One of them is in grooming. Another less obvious one is simply in the amount of time they spend watching each other and checking up on each other. So we tend to kind of write that off as, you know, they're looking for predators and they're looking for, for um, the local thug in the group to avoid being trampled on, but actually that's not what's actually happening in most of these intensely bonded species. What they're actually looking at is their grooming partners predominantly. So here's data we collected um, on all three of these species over the years. Um, and you can see the two bonded species, the Clipsring and the Gelada, have much, much higher looking rates. So this is looking at their grooming partners, uh, or in the case of the Clipsring, at their, their pair bond partner. Um, whereas the goats are looking at anything except um, uh, other people uh, in, the, in the foraging group they ha happen to be with. There are two other costs, cognitive costs, I think, that, that, that are absolutely crucial to the way these stable social groups work. One is the animals have to be willing to compromise because they have to be prepared to go to rest eat, when everybody else wants to go to rest, even if they would rather forage or vice versa. Um, so they have to be able to, to um, forego uh, their immediate kind of nutritional or ecological requirements in order to allow the group to stay together. Otherwise it's just going to disperse. That's exactly what happens in, in, in ungulate herds. And the, the animals' uh, time budgets get out of synchrony with each other, some go to rest, some carry on feeding and they just drift away and the group disperses and breaks up. Uh, and secondly, the other big problem they have to deal with is managing multi-way relationships. So it, this is not just a question of remembering that uh, the big thug in the group beat you up last time, so back off quickly. Um, what becomes important to them, um, and there's loads of uh, very good data from many primate species now showing this is that it really matters or they take very careful notice of the effect that their actions on another animal have on the other animals allies and friends because they may end up being on the receiving end of a attack by several individuals not just by um, the one opponent and these all these these um uh cognitive and behavioral components really seem to um, uh, <clears throat> correlate with the presence of the frontal pole. Uh, it's a very specific area in the primate brain. Um, Brodman, it was known as Brodman area 10, which sits on right on the, the front part there. This area is allows monkeys and apes to engage in full-scale causal reasoning rather than just um, kind of uh, standardized um, Pavlovian uh, stimulus response learning. They can do one trial learning as a result because they're learning principles rather than just association patterns. They can do analogical reasoning. It allows them to compare alternative outcomes from different strategies because they're thinking, they're, they're learning, if you like, in terms of, of um, uh, uh, principles rather than just facts. And in particular, inhibition was psychologists have called it inhibition of prepotent responses. So they're, they're able to suppress that tendency to grab the big slice of cake now in order to get an even bigger slice of cake uh, in the future. That, that area, the frontal pole, is unique to prime, uh, anthropoid primates. And there are one or two species um, that um, don't have them. And in fact, the one or two species of anthropoid primates that don't have them all appear on that left hand grade uh, um, uh, and have very chaotic social systems as a result, or seemingly as a result. 
Um, <clears throat> The other key component, and this goes back to this issue of being able to understand what's going on in other people's relationships, is related to mentalizing, which is critical for humans. In, in, in many studies now that we've done, the number of friends you have uh, correlates with your mentalizing capacities, how many mind states you can, can figure out. Now, this is a uniquely human capacity, but humans, uh, sorry, primates actually teeter on the edge of this, and they seem to be able to do something which other mammals in general don't seem to be able to do, and that is to figure out what the intentions are of other individuals and use cues uh, to identify uh, the, the intentions, even when there's no obvious behavior involved. And these seem to be related to what's become known as the default mode uh, neural network in the brain, which um, is a key feature of both the humans, it was originally identified in humans, but now has been shown by two different groups to exist in monkey brains as well. It links the frontal areas of the brain, uh, frontal pole, um, the orbital frontal cortex, the um, uh, um, rest of the frontal cortex there, um, at, with the temporal lobes via a corner of the parietal lobe, um, and is absolutely fundamental to managing social relationships, and particularly this ability to mentalize. So here looks like the mechanisms involved um, there are, in, in managing these kind of very complex groups. It's actually unique to, to, to primates. And here's some evidence that they, of how they bear on, on um, uh, uh, um, uh, the grade. So each of these graphs is one cognitive data set. Um, there's uh, three different data sets uh, on inhibition. They all use different um, tasks, sort of go, no go type tasks of various kinds, but they're, they're all different. Uh, each dot is a different species. Um, there's generalized executive function uh, up on the top right, which is essentially these key reasoning skills, causal reasoning and that kind of thing. And then the bottom right, a form of mentalizing. It's a French group that have developed a, a very nice um, uh, non-psychological form of mentalizing uh, task, which um, they can use, have, have tested various species of monkeys on. And I simply point out how all of these increase across the grades. So the sort of um, chaotic, uh, um, low-level, relatively antisocial uh, primates that live on, live on grade one don't do very, score very well on any of these uh, measures. And as you go across the grades to the very, very smart grade four people, uh, they tend to increase um, in, in performance level. So there's some evidence of, of real underlying cognition that's producing these effects. Um, what we think is going on is, at least in primates in particular, the real driver for this is predation risk. Um, it, it may be um, uh, defense against neighboring groups, that's a possibility, but there's a lot of evidence that for mammals in general, and I suppose birds as well, that animals uh, clump, form groups uh, when predator densities are high and, and then tend to disperse uh, when the predator risk declines. So these are actual predation rates um, for different species of monkeys and apes and prosimians in the, the four grades. And you can see it's broadly going down. Um, <clears throat> the, the species that live in very, very sort of chaotic, small social groups tend to suffer from an inordinate amount of predation, much, much more than you'd expect, even the nocturnal ones, where nocturnality is usually a means of protecting yourself from predation. Whereas the very, very smart species um, uh, have surprisingly low predation rates. And, and um, Suzanne Schultz has uh, produced several nice uh, data sets showing the different, both um, uh, specific habitats and across habitats, showing that um, predation rates by major predators um, declines uh, uh, as both group size and brain size increases. Now, uh, you, you may be somewhat angst-ridden at this point that, that uh, inhibition is being used as a, 
a social um, thing uh, and not an ecological thing because several people have used it as an index of uh, foraging skill. And the bad news is um, it really doesn't hang up uh, as a, uh, an index of foraging skill. So these are two completely separate databases. One is Stevenson's, the other is the McLean database, who both of whom used um, uh, inhibition as a measure of um, uh, foraging skill. And all we've done is, is essentially um, done a principal components analysis here of, uh, for each data set of um, what inhibition correlates with and um, um, uh, use uh, fruit in the diet, which is, which is uh, what's commonly used as a measure of foraging skill, essentially, because fruits are harder to find and more patchy in their distribution and also home range, range size. I threw that in simply because Stevens used it. And then two key things that are critical from this uh, coherence of social groups component. One is group size and the other is day journey length because both of those are well known to affect, um, this just goes back to, to the Conrad uh, synchrony stuff really, both of those dramatically affect um, the level of um, uh, synchrony of behavior in groups. So the bigger the groups you have, the more likely time budgets to get out of behavior is going to get out of synchrony. The longer the day journey you have to travel, the more likely your behaviors are going to get out of synchrony. And you can see for both of these data sets, clear as the bell, inhibition correlates with these two social, essentially social measures and um, uh, the ecological measures uh, are on a completely different dimension. In fact, if you um, stretch the analysis uh, uh, and, and reduce the, the size of the eigenvector for, for, for selection a fraction, then you get three, three uh, um, factors coming out, three components. And the, the third one contains in both data sets contains um, home range size, which here is kind of split awkwardly between these two. So I'm just making the point really that um, this is further evidence that what these animals living in stable bonded social groups are having to deal with is very uh, demanding and complex for them. Okay, so uh, just want to give you one brief example just to finish off on, on how these animals cope with the inevitable problem because if, if you're living in bonded social systems you can't shed in animals uh, as these these problems occur and it, it's back to again the trade-off between the benefits of living in group the benefits seem to be driven by predation risk and groups the size of group is a, a response to that uh, the bigger the group the less likely you are to uh, be worthwhile a predator attacking as against the cost in terms of fertility so these are baboons they're large-bodied large-brained very smart terrestrial uh, species live in large bonded social groups. So if you look at the total distribution of group sizes um, across the, all baboon populations, um, uh, I, what becomes apparent very quickly is that this is not a normal distribution. Uh, th this is a multimodal distribution. It turns out that the best way of describing this is, is as a set of four separate Poisson distributions which are overlaid on top of each other and they're slightly offset in each case and they have peaks respectively 20, 40, 80 and about 170 uh, group sizes. Um, the, the actual distribution of group sizes is, is there in the little inset. Now it ought to be obvious that these peaks have a scaling ratio of two, and a scaling ratio of two is strongly suggestive of fission. This has something to do with fission processes. So we came to the conclusion, trying to figure out what's going on here, that what we're dealing with is actually a series of nonlinear oscillators, which individual groups are circulating within and don't often go into uh, the neighboring oscillator. as a small oscillator somewhere between the first two peaks, 20 to 40, there's a middle oscillator at uh, 40 to 80, and there's a very large oscillator at 80 to 160. Now, that very large oscillator is peculiar to a couple of rather unusual baboons, the Gelada and Hamadryas baboons, which have these very complex multi-level social system, fission fusion type social systems. It's the two smaller ones, which are the sort of standard grouping sizes for baboons all over Africa, common baboons all over Africa. They're the, the interesting ones here. 
And what I'm suggesting is you have a pair of oscillators, which the animals can flip between. Now, it turns out that these oscillators are very characteristic of specific habitats. So if um, uh, you look at a habitat, everybody will be in one oscillator rather than the other, and the other oscillator will be extremely rare. Um, so that, <clears throat> in trying to explain that, we came up with the idea that this has to do really with the trade-off between fertility and group size. So here's the baboon data for fertility, birth rates per female per year for individual baboon groups. The symbols simply indicate um, uh, different, different populations, uh, sorry, different species of baboons, uh, just to show that their species is irrelevant in this context, they all map onto the same line. It is very obviously uh, not a uh, linear relationship. This is a very tight quadratic relationship. The dotted lines are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, and, and I'm really struck by these data because most of the time in any of these kind of behavioral and ecological analyses we do, natural instinct is just to stick linear regressions through them and not look at the data. If you stick a linear regression through that, course it's absolutely dead flat there's no relationship there at all um, and I think we forget at our peril um, that very often these effects are not uh, simple linear relationships uh, when you're dealing with natural data it may be simple linear relationships if you do experiments but not when you're dealing with natural data on wild animals so here we have that hump shaped curve again um, uh, suggestive of this trade-off between the size of group uh, and um, the cost in terms of fertility. But what struck me about this is that it actually divides, the peak is at, right on the cusp of the division between the two oscillators, the two lower oscillators there. Uh, and that maybe what's going on here is that the animals are trading essentially um, low fertility early on in a group's life in order to, to keep um, uh, uh, group size low uh, against um, uh, uh, the, the benefits of not being caught, benefits of living in an, a low predation risk habitat. In other words, on the left-hand side, if that's what's going on, uh, these, these groups which are oscillating between sort of um, uh, 20 and, and roughly 40 in size uh, is that they're starting off with a low low rate, but it's a long, slow growth uh, up to the point at which they, they uh, um, infertility starts to kick in um, at, at somewhere around 45 or 50, group size of 45 or 50. Uh, and it, it pays them to fish and that it, if they're in high, high predation risk habitats, then they, they flip over into the, the the right, the right hand side there. So it's roughly split down that middle. Um, so what's going on here is a long, slow growth uh, from small groups up to a sort of middle sized group. And then you, you fission into two um, and uh, come back down and start and you cycle round in there. And on the other side, the same thing's happening, but you're starting high. Uh, and as group size increases and you're suffering fertility effects, you're um, paying an increasing cost uh, so uh, with the slope down, so you split eventually and and and, and to go fishing and come back to the, the starting point again. And it turns out, in fact, that that's exactly what what is happening. These left-hand uh, populations are all living in low predation risk habitats and or well wooded habitats where they can uh, gain access to refugee re refuges, and the, the right-hand side are in high predation risk habitats. And if you try and cost out the payoff here uh, uh, to females in terms of fertility, lifetime fertility, of um, having that oscillators, the oscillators splitting at different points, so anywhere between 25 and 75, uh, so that um, if we go back here, that, that uh, you know you can pretty you could you could have a, uh, the oscillators being split anywhere uh, along the the the. Uh, X axis here. Um, so that's all we've done is uh, calculated what would happen if you're in if, uh, two populations that split in that sort of way and calculate the fitness ratios for the upper and the lower halves. And, and what this shows very nicely is that um, 
uh, fitness ratio approaches one, um, uh, uh, pretty only and pretty much exactly one, um, somewhere around 40 to 45, group sizes of 40 to 45 as, as the oscillator switch point. In other words, that point and that point only where the red bar is essentially marks in the SS in here. So this is a, a, a a really balanced system. Okay, so essentially the message I think for um, uh, mammalian social evolution generally is you have two, two options. And well, I suppose you have three options. You can live in very small groups uh, in D, or uh, if you have to live in big groups for reasons of predation uh, pressure, which is essentially the problem we're trying to understand here, then you have two choices. There's the cheap strategy, which is simply forming standard ungulate type herds, fission fusion, they're very flexible, they minimize the fertility cost because you can just go if it's getting too much for you. It minimizes the time cost to you because there's less disturbance, there's less uh, ecological competition going on. But you run the risk of being caught on your own uh, when the one predator turns up and you're likely to suffer um, high more predation mortality, um, which is what indeed seems to be the case. Um, the alternative uh, is you can go for bonded social groups. Um, that means you're never caught alone. You've always got your um, uh, support group with you, if you like. The result is you have much lower predation mortality as a result, but you have much less flexibility unless you use the kind of strategy of just talk, walked you through the baboons, which has becomes very complex for them to handle, basically, I think. Uh, you pay a very high fertility cost, and you need some mechanism to, to mitigate that fertility cost, which means having uh, essentially bonded social relationships, because that just keeps everybody off your back. Uh, you, you have these high cognitive costs to pay because you've got to maintain uh, synchrony of, of behavior right through and you have a huge time cost to pay in terms of the bonding uh, mechanisms you need to, to maintain these these in, uh, intense social bonds and you know they in terms of time it, they really are extraordinarily expensive for some of these very social species like baboons so that's it uh, uh, we can go back to the screen and um, Elizabeth can um, handle the questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Robin. That was a very fascinating and thought-provoking talk. Um, very interesting. Um, so while the questions are starting to come in from the audience, I thought I would start off with a question of my own, first of all. Um, so I was curious if you could perhaps speculate um, when considering the stability of these smaller socially bonded groups that you were describing, um, I was wondering what could be the possible impact of environmental stress, such as pathogens or um, harsh um, environmental conditions, such as extreme temperatures, on um, the energy trade-offs in those individuals between maintaining the socially bonded group, but then also withstanding the external um, environmental stress. Okay, uh, I mean, path pathogens uh, are a perennial problem for everybody, and um, there is no doubt that pathogens uh, <clears throat> tend to spread in primates, at least, which is where we kind of know most, I think, probably in terms of pathogens or social species, um, spread down grooming networks. In other words, if you will spend large quantities of your day basically cuddling other people, you're going to catch stuff from them. And that's exactly what happens. So as far as I really concerned, there's just one of the costing groups, you know, that, that's an, another unavoidable cost. You're going to catch other people's pathogens uh, and you either have to find ways of mitigating them or you put up with it. Um, and I'm not sure we can really say much more than that at, at the moment. Um, environmental stresses are a big issue and and what has become very clear from all the time budget models that we've done which as i mentioned we've done now for 12 years of primates so we've done all the major groups of old, old world monkeys and apes and, and one new world monkey and i've also built a, a model for the goats as well they all come down to temperature right that is the only thing that really uh, drives 
them. And temperature becomes important in several different respects for them. One is it imposes a huge time load simply because you have to have time out in the middle of the day when things are hot for tropical species, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and you can't do anything else, you can't even groom, uh, is, is what seems to be, be, be the case. Uh, so there's another big chunk of your day gone, which is just loading the time pressures on you for, for, for foraging and travel. Um, the big other big problem is the effect that temperature has on digestibility of forage, and indeed anything you eat, basically. So the hotter it gets, the poorer the quality of the, the resources you have. Uh, and that's bad for folivores uh, uh, because um, uh, leaves and uh, of grasses and, and, and trees tend to get pretty dry and indigestible. And it doesn't do um, uh, fruits much good either. So this is bad news. Um, uh, uh, so important actually is temperatures. It comes out as the key problem uh, under climate change for primates. So the species that are going to get hammered most, and they're going to be very seriously hammered, even by a couple of degrees increase in, in mean temperatures, are the folivores. Because the, it, 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 you know, leaves become essentially indigestible. All these species need relatively young, soft leaves. And uh, if temperatures increase significantly, it just causes the leaves to have a much shorter growing period and they become drier and, and indigestible much more quickly. And uh, we're gonna lose most of them, I'm absolutely convinced. And there's pretty much nothing we can do about them uh, because none of them can move. They, they could solve the problem by moving their biogeographic distributions polewards. Right. The, mm -hmm. the trouble with that is there are loads of people in the way who aren't going to be happy. And B, I don't think they could move that fast enough. Um, you know, it just just isn't going to happen. So we are, you know, we're looking at lots of losses there. The frugivores will cope much better, it seems. But the frugivores are also the smartest too. So they 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 win both ways. They've got a, a food resources which are not so badly hammered by by rising temperatures, uh, but also they've got enough brains to um, uh, com uh, cope with climat climatic instability, environmental instability. It's the same you know, reason that um, you know, all the, 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 the whole Arctic birds uh, species genera that, that spend the winter up in these grim northern climes, you know, all have big brains. You know, the stupid ones go south and stay, you know, stay in the tropics for the winter, and the smart ones can cope. You know, they can cope with the, the, the um, environmental instability. So I think those are, you know, they're both very serious issues that animals have to cope with in the in, in the in the complex biological systems-based world that we all live in. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think multifactorial in interaction. Yeah, yeah. Going on, yeah, sure. I, think, I think we forget that often, you know, yeah. far too, too much time is spent looking at single cause effect um, uh, models, if you like, when in fact, mm -hmm. everything has a knock on consequence somewhere else down the system and causes you problems. And that, those are, you know, the things that get overlooked as they tweak how the system, you know, system works. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think so. Um, so we have another question which relates to um, the earlier part of your talk when you were talking about female-female um, female competition and the stress that that generates and how that had knock-on negative effects for fertility. Um, and the question asks, why doesn't the number of males similarly increase social stress and thus decrease fertility? Um, well, like I said, for about 25 years, I spent an awful lot of time doing field work, large ungulates and, and primates, assuming that was the case, that it was males riding their motorbikes around the village green uh, at, when the pubs closed on a Saturday night, stressing everybody out, which, uh, you know, because, you know, that's what it looks like. If, when, if you study most of these species, particularly primates, I guess, uh, in the wild, you've got all these males, you know, displaying and bouncing about the trees, fighting each other, and it's chaos and uh, uh, the females are running and the babies are running and uh, and it, you know you think this is and 
feral goats, which you know, one of the reasons I worked on them for so long is, you know, the, their mating system is is completely frenetic. I mean, it's absolutely chaotic, and the stress the females are put under is just enormous. Yeah. I was convinced for a very long time that this was the case. So we were really quite taken aback when trying to look at this in primates data comparatively, it just didn't come out at all, no matter how hard we tried. Um, <clears throat> so I, and I think partly that's because there just aren't so many males, right? So if you have a small number of males in a group, hierarchies, certainly in primates, hierarchies tend to be quite stable and there isn't a lot of fighting because everybody knows how, where they stand and and there are big power differentials but be, between the males so there aren't enough there aren't enough males of similar fighting power uh, to want to contest with each other now and that holds very kind of stable dominant hierarchies in males up to around four or five males in a group if you get more than four five males in a group then it starts to fall apart because you're more likely to get males of similar power um, so it it kind of is the not to say it never happens, it's just to say that in the generality, it doesn't happen often enough to be a driver in the system. Paradoxically, uh, there is some evidence buried in there that males can be a positive advantage. Um, uh, mm. uh, and that happens, and we see it in some species. We now think that's why the Hamadryas and Gelada have peculiar social systems where they have these small reproductive units that form higher level groupings that in turn form higher level groupings still. So a multi-level system. Mm -hmm. And we think what's happened is that this is the solution to living in very large groups indeed. So they're the third oscillator on the extreme right, um, coping with having very large numbers of females around. And the, the way they've solved that problem, both again, smart end of the primate cognitive distribution, is to develop a system where the females form coalitions because what what solves the problem is the females forming coalitions with each other right? mm. the males are just the males are a waste of space they just you know, wander around normally you know they're not yeah. doing very but in the in the to make these super large groups what they've done is attach themselves to individual males and use the males as sumo wrestlers as hired guns Right. And that's exactly what happens in gorillas as well. Um, in fact, that's where originally, well, the original proposal was made by a couple of um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 ethologists, a human ethologist. And I think the other one worked on um, seals, actually, both women, um, uh, and, and said, no, no, a lot of this stuff can be understood in terms of, of, of basically females using males as hired, hired guns to, to keep everybody else away from them. As I, it's known as the hired, hired gun hypothesis. Uh, uh, but I think we actually see it at work here in some of these species where they actually do use uh, males as extra bulwarks against the stresses created by living in very large groups. It's a sort of another step, step beyond as it were. Um, but but yes, I'm, you know, if you've got too many males in the group, then then there will be too much fighting, and, and it will be like Saturday night after the pub's closed. I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, it's an alternative perspective on the whole male female dynamics for sure. Um, okay, so I think that's all we have time for for today, actually. Um, but it is our great pleasure to thank Robin once again for a truly fascinating and interesting talk. So thank you, Robin. Pleasure. Um, so just before um, we leave today, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that our next talk will take place on Wednesday next week and will be presented by Professor Jeff Parker on sexual selection and the sexual cascade. So we hope that you can join us then, same time and same place. And in the meantime, check out our updates on Slack and our Twitter feed and sw spread the word about our seminars. So thanks for taking part and until next time, stay safe and see you again soon. Goodbye.